Uh, and a wonderful work of the spirit. So, welcome, Jean. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Let's pretend that we're absolutely full. <laughs> and uh, sort of disport yourselves around, and then we can really pretend you're really fun. What we're going to talk about this morning is uh, this is spiritualism. And less than a lack, this is spiritualism. Uh, the very small attendance this morning indicates where spiritualism is. And uh, I want to talk about why spiritualism is as it is in this day and age. In order to uh, discuss anything in the present, I think you have to look to the past. And if you look uh, to the past in spiritualism, you'll find that spiritualism started before 1848. I know that we use that uh, year as a sort of bookmark, 1848, Hinesville, 31st of March, the Fox Sisters. But in fact, Andrew Jackson Davis had been working, and working successfully in New York for a long time before 1848. He was a man that was particularly gifted spiritually. He was gifted not only as a medium uh, who was able to prove survival, but he was also a visionary, a visionary that was able to walk with the world of spirit, walk into the world of spirit, see what was going on in the world of spirit. And it's interesting uh, to know that when he walked in the world of spirit, he saw things in a different way to that that Swedenborg saw them. Because he saw schools, he saw children being educated in the world of spirit, educated in a way that uh, education these days has caught up with, the broad stream of education has caught up with. But spiritualist education has fallen behind, fallen behind badly. And again, I think that that is indicative of the few people that are here. <coughs> we hear tales that when Emma Harding's Britain uh, was due to speak in England or America or Australia or wherever she was at that time, halls filled. Hundreds of people came to listen to her words. And I'm quite certain that that was true. We hear that about an awful lot of people in the world of spiritualism in the early last century. And I thought, why? Where did the enthusiasm go? Where did the interest go? Where did the desire to know more go to? Because it must have gone somewhere. Although people are different in this day and age, they want to know more. And yet, where are they? They come into our churches, they come in for the message, they sit through the philosophy, and they get bored through the philosophy. And there you have it, they get bored through the philosophy. Is it all right if I move, sweetheart? Oh, good. Because I'm a mover. <laughs> Philosophy should change. Philosophy has got to change. If philosophy doesn't change, then it dies. It's got to be of use to people in this day and age. And that's where we've gone wrong. Because we're still using the philosophy of 80 years ago. We're still saying spiritualism is based on our seven principles, and that's fine. They're good. They're pertinent. But we're also saying that spiritualism's main message is you do not die, you cannot die, and we can communicate with the bubble of dead. And it shouldn't be. Because spiritualism is about far more than that. And that brings me to the main question, what is spiritualism? It's a way of life, or it should be a way of life. And most of the spiritualists in the churches today do not make it a way of life. And this I think is where the mistake has been made. Instead of demanding, <coughs> demanding of people, we demand to give them all the time. We give them. What will they come into the church for? Messages. So let's give them more and more messages. Proof of survival. Let's give them more and more proof of survival. Even uh, when we do workshops, we pander to them. We pander to people. We bring out our little boxes of tricks, Coloured pencils, sand, water, ribbons, scarves, you name it, we give it. Instead of saying, right, let's talk about philosophy. 
Let's talk about what you really are, what spiritualism can honestly give you in this day and age. Because it's got an awful lot to offer. Spiritualism was started well over 150 years ago in its mainstream. But if you look, if you look at the way the way it was prepared by spirit, then you can see it started at least over a hundred years before that time. For 250 to 300 years, spirit have made the way for this new philosophy. Ask yourselves why. Is it just so that you can know you're not going to die? That you're going to live on after death? Is it just so that we can communicate with the departed and know that we are still loved and know that we still love? Is it just there to support us? No. Spiritualism is about living and knowing and being. It's about a message that has been there for thousands of years, that we're part of God, that God is truly an integral part of every person living, every person that has been, is, or will be. Spiritualism is about life and improving the quality of your life here and now. You know, over 2,000 years ago, well over 2,000 years ago, all the sciences and the religious philosophies were one. People didn't separate them out. Religion was part of life. If you go into the ancients, the aboriginals, they are the people that we can study best and see more. You can see that their religious beliefs and their rights were part of their life, an integral part of their life. They didn't have separate buildings as such, just to come and worship. But they did have special places where they could come particularly close to their gods. Now I'm not suggesting for one minute that we go back to over 2,000 years ago or to the Aboriginal way of life. But I think we have to think about why it changed. Everybody thinks that Christianity was to do with the Dark Ages. Or the Dark Ages were mixed in with Christianity. Because Christianity had a peculiar way of thinking that only one man was a son of God. Only one man was allowed to communicate into the world of spirit. Swedenborg thought that as well, you know. The followers of Swedenborg uh, re revered him. They deified him almost. But they weren't allowed to be mediums. They were only allowed to propagate his teachings. Here we have a new century. Here we have a coming together. The mind is separated. You have the rational side and you have the inspirational side. Over 2,000 years ago, the inspirational side was used mainly Intuition was the order of the day. People learned, but they learned through intuition. They made leaps of knowledge. They didn't work it through. And as a result, only the great and the good lived well. They lived well. Uh, they had everything to their fingertips, including slaves, including all those people that made life comfortable for them. What they didn't have was sanitation. What they didn't have was swift travel. What they didn't have was access to the masses of all these comforts. And that's why the Dark Ages had to come about. The side of the brain that operated then was the intuitional side of the brain. Well, the rational side was still there, but it wasn't brought to the forefront. And it had to be like the pendulum of the clock swings, and it swings to purpose, and it swings to the edge of its periphery. The ladies and gentlemen. I knew we had one somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that pendulum has to swing and come into a balance. And that's what's happening now. For 2,000 years, the rational side of the brain has been brought to the fore. And as a result, you had the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution has an effect on spiritualism. Think why? 200 years before spiritualism was ever thought about. Without that industrial revolution, you couldn't be here now. Without that industrial revolution, spiritualists could not operate now. 
because that had the effect in England at least of freeing people uh, from their original tasks. You know, the Hindus are divided into castes, and that caste system was uh, devised for a particular purpose. It was so that everybody had work of some sort. And the father handed that work down to his son, and they handed it down to his son. And so you had the caste system. And even the untouchables had their work. And so it had sense. But in uh, England and places of uh, that ilk, you had a similar sort of system. It wasn't called the caste system. It was called the Lord of the Manor system. But everybody had their task. And they did the same as their fathers or forefathers before them. But the Industrial Revolution changed all that. It meant that people could come into towns and they could slave away in factories instead of in the fields. It meant that children were chained to their benches for 12 hours a day instead of being out picking nuts or berries or doing whatever it is that children do. But it was a good thing in the end may not have been in the start, but it was a good thing in the end, because conditions did get better. And it meant that people like you and me that 200 years ago would not have been able to do this Saturday afternoon, sitting in a church, listening, travelling, eating well, sleeping well, knowing that we've got a bath if we get dirty, knowing that we've got a toilet if we need it. The Industrial Revolution changed the life of English people right through the country. It freed them to be able to do things that they weren't able to do. And that's where the rational side of the brain came in. Because more and more inventions freed more and more people. And so we have now a new century, a new way of looking at it. We've been to the stars. We've walked on the moon. We've been to the depths of the seas and the bowels of the earth. Now we've got to explore the most important part of the whole wide world. And that's ourselves. And that is what spiritualism is about. It's about exploring yourself. It's about getting to know every single part of you. Not just the part that says two and two makes four. Four and four make eight. It's about getting to know the part of you that is linked through your subconscious into a higher self. Proving that man is greater than the sum total of his parts. Proving that there is a dimension to man that cannot be measured by science. Cannot always be seen by the naked eye. Cannot always be heard by the physical ear. And yet exists. Exists to propel man forward. Forward and upward, but inward first of all, for surely that is the greatest pathway and the longest journey, but the shortest distance. And so you see, spiritualism changed its people. And spiritualism has changed. When it first started, it started off with a great loud bang. Why? Why was physical phenomena so prevalent in the 1800s? Why was physical phenomena present in almost every town in the 1800s? We can look at the mechanics and we can see why it worked mechanically. But why did it work as a whole? I've thought a lot about this. And you know, I think that it was so prevalent because it was necessary for it to be prevalent. Spirit wanted to bring the attention of the world to a new message. You can say there's nothing new under the sun, but there is, you know. For thousands and thousands of years, we have evidence and we have records of Spirit speaking to us. Usually it's the voice of God or one of the archangels that's doing it. Joan of Arc heard her angels. Mohammed heard his. Jesus heard the voice of God, as did John the Baptist. What do we hear? What do we hear inside of ourselves? Not the voice of God, perhaps, not the voice of the angels, but surely the voice of those that have gone before us. 
And that's the difference. We know through the message that was brought to us in 1848 that we can talk back. We know that they're not discarnate. We know that there is a substance to them. We know that if we ask a question, we can actually get an answer. The Fox sisters proved that when they devised the code to speak to the peddler. And when they got answers from the peddler, and it sometimes makes me laugh because I think to myself, the first real answer that has ever been recorded from the world of spirit is a complaint. Is <laughs> it true? How did you die? I was killed <laughs> and I'm walled up. I've never even been buried properly. Can you just imagine? You know, the first real reply that we've got is a complaint about the conditions of his passing. But it's true and it's wonderful as well because it shows that we don't change dramatically when we go into the world of spirit. Swedenborg was the first one to actually rec to record that that man does not change dramatically when he dies. And so you've got to think of it in that way. You've got to recognize that when you do first go, you retain your earth memories. You retain what you are. You retain even your shape to some degree. For how long? I don't know. I don't believe that anybody knows. We contact the first, first level of the world in spirit. All those people that tell you they've got links with the higher guys and the higher spheres, forget them, sweethearts. <laughs> their imagination is greater than their knowledge. All those people that tell you that Jesus can come back and talk on earth, forget it. If he hasn't gone beyond that, then he wasn't much of a spirit. And I believe that he was a great spirit, a great prophet. And so you see, you've got to use your common sense. In spiritualism, if you don't use your common sense, if you float with the angels and forget to keep your feet on the ground, then you've got problems. You've got problems because you're not only unbelievable, but you cannot even truly substantiate what you think you believe yourself. You might just as well belong to any one of the ancient religions that has superstition and dogma and creed to stand by. You might as well not come into this century because you belong in the last one. And I don't believe that spiritualism does belong in the last one. I believe that it must change. That people must change it. It will not change by itself. Spirit have brought a great message to us. They've brought a great truth to us. But we are the ones that have to pick that message up. You can offer all you want. You can put food on the table to the people. But you can only put the food on the table to the people. They are the ones that must actually pick it up and use it for their own good. Spirit can offer us all they want in the way of guidance and wisdom. But we are the ones that have to pick it up, use it, interpret it, make it usable in this century and on here on earth. Because this is where it is needed. A lot of what we learn is going to be of no use to us when we die. But the very fact that we learn it, the very fact that we put our brains to good use, the very fact that we try to harmonize ourselves and bring ourselves into balance, this is the important thing. So what do we do with what we've got that counts? For thousands of years, religions have talked about democracy and equality. And if you look at them, you can see that it's absolute rubbish. There's no such thing as true equality on earth when you judge it by earthly standards. You can only judge true equality by spiritual and eternal standards. Think about it. You don't have the advantages I've got. And I don't have some of the advantages you've got. You cannot say that you can be equal to me and I cannot say that I can be equal to you. I am different from you, you are different from me. You are individuals with your individual gifts and capabilities. I am an individual with my own gifts and my own capabilities. Gordon Higginson once said, don't ever try to be as good as I am. You will never succeed. And I reiterate, don't ever try to be as good as I am. 
but be as good as you can be and you will succeed. But that is the only way that I can succeed, is being as good as I am and then endeavouring to become better. And that is what spiritualism is all about. Endeavouring to become a more complete and more balanced person in yourself, not in other people. Not looking to other people for their wisdom, but rather listening to what they have to say and then thinking about it. And if it is right for you, make it your own. Not believing other people necessarily are true, but rather listening to what they have to say and then deciding, is that right for me? Because we all do things at different times in our life and we are all capable of different things at different times in our life. I look back, I was telling our friend here, we are not a Christian-based organisation. I am not a Christian, but I was. I was a Christian in this town. Uh, if you go along uh, the road into um, Hove, you will find a church still there, a big church, a Baptist church, where I was fully immersed at the age of 17. I first gave my witness as a Christian at the age of 17 it was right for me at that time. It was good for me at that time. It is no longer right for me or good for me. I have moved on. I have made my development and my progress. But I'm quite certain that there are people there that were also immersed on that morning that have led the path of Christianity and it's been right and good for them throughout their life. And it will continue to be right and good for them throughout their life. Spiritualism is right and good for me. I belong to the organisation of spiritualism. And there have been times when I have wished I had not belonged to the organisation of spiritualism. Because it is limiting. It is definitely limiting. And I don't want to be limited anymore. And yet, I listen to the spirit that is within and I know that I am doing the right thing for me at this time because I am destined to work within this organisation throughout my life. This is part of my destiny, part of my fate if you will, part of my karma if you will and it is right that it should be and so therefore I will have to wait until I die to other things because I don't have so much time that I can look into everything at once. And so it's right for the country and for the world. Each religion has come about for a different reason. Christianity came about through Paul. St. Paul did not start with Jesus. Jesus was a Jew. He was a good Jew and if you read his words in the Bible, you will find he has come to teach people the law, to remind them of the law. People tend to think it's a Christian law, and it's not. He came to teach them the Jewish law, the rabbinical law, and that was his destiny. The fact that he was the initiator of a new religion that is neither here nor there. Paul, in fact, took uh, his words and used them for his own ends and created what was to be for the next 2,000 years a very important religion in this world. A religion that helped to bring about spiritualism. A religion that helped to bring about uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution. A religion that helped to bring about the rational side of the brain and the development of that importance so that we could then take that message, we could then take that understanding and take it forward it's like the, the light of the Olympic Games. It's handed from one hand to the other. And so it is with philosophy and religion. It is handed from one hand to the other. And each must add his part or her part to that flame before handing it on. And so it is with eternity. Each generation must do what it will and do its best it can so that it can hand on to the children and the children's children and so go on into the future. You know, spiritualism can bring a great 
feeling of complacency because we know that we have all the time in the world. But if you look at it in its true light, then that complacency is removed and you recognize the fact that you do not have all the time in the world. There are things that must be done and your destiny must be fulfilled. And so therefore you must take notice and use every moment of every day because your life is important. You are adding to a pattern, a pattern of destiny and a pattern of the future. And without you that pattern will not be fulfilled. We believe that we are part of God. We believe that God is all things, a unity. And if we truly believe that, we do not just pay, pay lip service to that belief, then we must also recognize that in the end all is one. But if all is one, then all people must be part of that one. And all people must come into that one. You see, why is that your whole horizon? If you truly believe it and do not just pay lip service to it, the spiritualism is not about lip service. It's not about being fully immersed when you are any age. It's not about converting or believing in any one religion. It's about accepting the fact of the divinity of yourself as part of God. It's about accepting the fact you are spirit here and now. You are part of God here and now. But as you are part of God, so are all men. All men, not just the good men, not just those that adhere to any set of beliefs, but rather all men, good, bad, indifferent, wicked, yes. They are all part of God and all must come into that one. And so you see, if you truly believe and truly accept the fact that you are spiritualist and spiritual, then you have responsibilities that no other religion can place upon your shoulders. You have responsibilities that no other philosophy can place upon you or upon your destiny. You have responsibilities that do not allow you to kneel in submission, but rather force you to stand and stand, be tall and be straight and be true. You have an understanding that allows you to recognize the God in all things. And so therefore you must accept the fact that you can no longer hate. You can no longer despise. You are equal with all people, if not here on earth, then in that oneness that is your ultimate destiny. Your fate is ordained. <laughs> Your fate is ordained, you cannot move aside from it. And so you see that great pattern, that pattern of allowing each religion to answer the needs of the people. Muhammad went under his blanket, and we know that it was probably a trance condition that he was experiencing, just as we recognize in the Bible the experiences of Jesus were trance conditions. We recognize materialization, in the three of the mount, we recognize the conditions that were necessary for materialization in all the stories of materialization in the Bible. We recognize the power of healing in the stories of the great religions. We recognize the power of predestination in the, of the great religions. And so you see, you have all these things brought together in the world of spirit. And you have the pattern. You know, I very often think that how different the world would be if the printing press was not discovered. <laughs> it's true. Would we be spiritualists if the printing press was not discovered? And I can go back even further. You know, if you're going to trace the advent of uh, spiritualism, I can go back even further and find many, many other things that were necessary for mankind to be able to live decently so that they were able to give time. A lot of people, a lot of sentimental people, look at the uh, races, uh, primitive races, and say, oh, that was so spiritual. And they look at the races even of the world today. Oh, they are 
so spiritual. Look at the Indians, how spiritual they were. How often do you hear of Indian guides? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're spiritual, they live close to nature. This and gentlemen, how much time do you think primitive people had to be spiritual? How much time do you think the people of the world who are poor and have nothing and have to grub for their food had to be spiritual? How much time do you think those people that live in countries like India or Africa and are poor have to be spiritual? We can be spiritual, we can devote our time to being spiritual because we have the tools of a modern society which allow us to earn our living in a few short days of the week and give the rest of those days time to be spiritual and to think of philosophy and the beauty of the world and the skies. Think about it and think where you would like to be spiritual in today's society or in 200 years ago society. Yes. I agree with you, I prefer today, but but, what have we done with this knowledge? It's been put on the table for us and what have we done with it? We have all these advantages and what do we do with them? We grub around for messages from the dead. And that's what spiritualism has become. Instead of seeking to know and to know more, knocking so that the door will be opened unto us, we knock on the table and say, is anybody there? And we knock on the doors of the church and we say, who is the medium and can they give good messages? It is up to us to change these things. And it is changing. I am in the position to know, for I travel the length and the breadth of this country. And as a person that has worked with national committees, I am in a position to hear these things and to know what people are doing. And I know that more and more people are starting once again to listen to their inner self, to listen to the voice of spirit, to recognize that spirit is not just about getting messages. It's about a message, a great message, the most important message of all, that you are God message that came with all the great religions of all the times in the world. You are part of God. But this time there's a big difference. This message is not coming through one person. It's not coming through one great prophet who sees and is seen, who knows and is known, but rather through many, many people and so you have the medium in the 1800s, the physical medium, the one capable of producing phenomena, the one that can make the show, the one that can bang the drum and say, look and see what we've got. Look, these happenings do not conform to any of your concepts. These happenings do not belong to any of your physics or your sciences but rather are outside all the laws that you know. And so that great message is already given. There are laws that we do not know. There is life outside the earth and beyond the earth. And that life is ongoing. But it's intelligent life. It's not just a disembodied voice that says, know that I am God, or know that this is my son, or know that if you blow the trumpet, the walls will fall down. What sort of God would attack Jericho? A little town, or that's all it was, a little trading town with peaceful people inside. What God would attack that? Or allow a horde to come in and attack? Surely it was one of their ancestors. Surely it was somebody that wanted their sons or grandsons to succeed and take over territories. Think about it. You can see all these stories so much more clearly if you look with the eyes of knowledge and the understanding of spiritualism. The concept 
of living eternally has been with man since man first thought, since man first was. Look back and see the graves where artifacts were buried with the people, all the great people, the good people, the rich people. Even now I heard yesterday they've actually discovered a king, or a king's remains I should say, that were buried thousands of years ago, very near the uh, Stonehenge. Uh -huh. And together they have uh, flints, they have arrowheads, they have jewellery. No doubt there was food there in the first place, just like the Egyptians. All to go into the earth afterlife, to sustain their life to come. Well, now we know you don't have to be rich. Now we know you don't have to be great. Now we know you don't even have to be good. Because the peddler wasn't good. The peddler wasn't great. The peddler certainly wasn't rich. And he was able to talk to us from beyond and make his complaint. And make his complaint intelligently. And this is it. Intelligence. The test of intelligence is memory. The test of intelligence is ongoing memory, and that's just what that peddler had. He had the memory of what happened to him, and he had the memory of what happened to him after he was dead. And there you have proof of intelligent survival, and that is what spiritualism is. Your intelligence will go on, your body will be burnt or buried, for the worms on fire, one or the other. It is destined. But you, your intelligence, your spirit part, that is the part that goes on. And that is the part that you should be feeding. And that is why spiritualism has not fulfilled its purpose. A great message is once again being left on the table to go mouldy, just like all those great messages that the great masters brought onto the earth. The fact that you are God here and now, the fact that you are brother to your fellow man, the fact that we belong together, and if we do somebody down, ultimately we're doing ourselves down because we belong in one. But if you help your fellow man, then ultimately you are helping yourself. If you send out your healing thoughts, not just for those that are sick in body, but those that are sick in mind, those that still walk the paths of darkness, those that do not see that good is God and God is good and that we should be part of that, must be part of that. The philosophy of spiritualism can and must change. A spiritualism like all the great religions of the past will stagnate and ultimately die. And that great message will again be wasted. Look at the way the mediums have changed and you will see the path of destiny. You have first the physical medium and from them you get the uh, entranced medium. The one that will stand like Emma Hardinge Britain did and speak for hours on subjects that are perhaps not known to her, listening to the world of the world of spirit, listening to their voices, their ideas, their concepts, listening to their philosophy, listening to their goodness, listening to their love, listening to those things that the people wanted to hear, listening to the voice of freedom, but that is what spiritualism can give every person. A freedom that cannot be imagined. A freedom that cannot always be visualized. A freedom from fear, ladies and gentlemen, not just fear of death. Oh, I've heard that so often. What does spiritualism give you? Gives you knowledge of life after death. It does away the fear of death, of course it does not. Every single human being clings to life. And most of us are frightened of dying because we're venturing into the unknown. But what spiritualism can do 
is give you an understanding of the unknown, give you a taste of that world to come, teach you how to touch the inner part of yourself so that you are familiar with all of yourself, not just the outer body, but the inner soul, the inner spirit. Spiritualism gives you the tools to seek and to find. Spiritualism gives you the opportunity to be your own medium. And that is where we are going, and that is where we must go. Ah, I see you look puzzled there. But you see, you are looking at the old concept of mediumship. You are looking at the medium that can prove survival, rather than the one that can touch and be with spirit. And that is the medium I'm talking about. The medium that every person in the world, no matter how insensitive that person is, can be. And that is our evolution. If you look at it, you have the trance, who produce physical phenomena. You have the entrance, who speak with the voice of spirit. Then you have the mental medium, capable of listening to spirit. Then you have the sensitive, capable of feeling spirit, feeling the power and the presence, feeling the vibrations that are around. And that is what I'm talking about. The sensitive a person that can feel that love, can open themselves to the knowledge of that love. Not hearing voices, not seeing visions, but feeling as we feel each other. You know, a long time ago now, uh, I learned uh, how to psychometrize things. A long time ago, I learned how to psychometrize things. And then I learned how to read auras and uh, read the history of people. Then I thought a lot about it and realized that I wasn't always reading the aura. I was actually psychometrizing the people. And then, by pure accident, I happened to be looking at um, a spirit communicator one day, and they had hold, just pulled, held that hand out to me. And I looked at that hand, and at that day I had been reading an article, How to Read the Palm. <laughs> really, this is honours as I stand here. And I looked at the hand of spirit, I thought, oh, they are very nervy, unsensitive. <laughs> and I actually, I actually noticed enough while they had that hand held out to be able to tell the recipient of the message a number of things just by looking at the spirit palm. But it was a new door. It was amazing. I thought, if I can read their palm and read it accurately, then I can read their aura. I can psychometrize them. And do you know, quite often, I will be so aware of them there that instead of waiting for them to tell me things, I actually share their vibrations and psychiatrize them. It's a much easier way of giving messages. <laughs> it's much quicker and it's very, very accurate. You be surprised how often I do it. I'm giving away the secrets of my training. <laughs> but it is important that we recognize these things that they really are there. Now, for instance, there is no way in the world that spirit has a, a hand in the way that I have a hand. This is physical. It's intended for this earth. It's intended to pick things up, put things down. It's intended to touch people, you know, to have a solid substance there within it. But spirit do have the memory, and they also have the capability of creating the image of that memory. And so therefore they are there creating the image of what they were, remembering what they were. And it just shows us how far we've got to go in the exploration of the mind and the mental faculties. And this is where spiritualism can come in, in this day and age, to explore the mental faculties, not just of the world of spirit, but the mental faculties of people the spiritual understanding of people, but most of all, of yourself. Yourself, ladies and gentlemen. And this is where it is. It's this coming together of the two sides of the brain, the rational and the intuitional. We're allowed now to do both. Even the sciences recognize the intuitional scientists. 
They don't do it rationally. They intuit things. You see, it's all coming together for the future and the future of mankind. Will we blow ourselves up? Will we? I wonder. Is it important? I don't think so. You see, as long as we need substance for our development, our spiritual development, then we will live in a physical world. As long as we need to be separated out from each other in order to learn to love each other in spite of that, then we will have a physical experience. This is what we should be teaching people. We should be teaching people that as long as it's necessary, we'll live on Earth. And when it's no longer necessary, then we'll no longer live here. But we can't die. We can't be wiped out. We change, but we don't die. No matter ever dies, and spirit cannot die, you cannot conceive the death of God, can you? Can you? Okay. <laughs> right. But you are part of God. And so you cannot conceive your own death. You cannot conceive a time when you will no longer be. You are all things in all things. You are all things in all times. But this is a much wider statement than it appears to be. Or you may think, is, is that not wide enough for you? But it can give you the courage to be all things here and now. It can give you the courage to live your life here and now. It can give you the courage and the understanding to recognise that nothing is truly beyond you. And nothing can defeat you. While your spirit is there, you are inviolate. Nothing can touch that part of yourself. Nothing can harm that part of yourself. Because ultimately, you are one with God. Ultimately, you are one with all mankind. And so, spiritualism is life. This is spiritualism. Out there is spiritualism. The road you travel is spiritualism. The way you believe is spiritualism. The words you speak are spiritualism. And it doesn't matter how you are, or what you believe, or how you behave. Ultimately, you are perfect. So the sooner you come to that point of realisation, the less time you're going to waste. The sooner you come to that realisation, the more you're going to be able to enjoy your life, and the more you're going to be able to do with your life. And the more you recognise that spiritualism is about life, the more these churches of ours will start to fill, and the more we will recognise that these messages are very nice. But when it push comes to shove, we will find out one day that we live on after death. And if we don't find out that we live on after death, we are going to feel foolish, aren't we? <laughs> or will we? Because will we be there to feel foolish? We win either way. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got uh, everything to win and nothing to lose. Because if we move on after death and we're no longer there, we'll not know about it. <laughs> if we do live on after death and we are there and we've wasted our life, then we've got time to put it right. We've got time to put it right. We've got all eternity. But you might as well do it right in the first place, I think. And then you can move on to the next stage, which hopefully will be a lot more pleasant than this one. Spiritualism is changing. Your sensitive will change until one day, I hope, that we will no longer think of life and religion as being part of life but rather as religion being life, spiritualism being life, philosophy being life. And that day, heaven will indeed come to earth. We have a
minds of the Almighty. We are the minds of the Master here on earth. Let us use our hands and our minds to increase the development of our spirit so that we can truly believe that heaven indeed is here on earth and the destiny of mankind is ordained. I can talk for another ten minutes if you'd like me to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just looked at my notes, you know, and I see there's one or two things. Um, I put down an uh, organisation, is it needed? And perhaps I ought to uh, talk a little bit about organisation, is it needed? Because people do tend to think of spiritualism as being organisation. And we are part of that organisation. And um, you could say that organisation does impose limits on the whole concept of spiritualism. And in fact, it does impose limits, there's no doubt about that. However, having said that, um, I can argue both sides of this question, that the organisation itself spoils the concept of the spiritual, but also it promotes the concept of the spiritual. But without organisation, you're going to get an awful lot of people with an awful lot of peculiar ideas promoting spiritualism themselves, having no basis from which to start. At least the organisation does provide some sort of understanding and basis uh, from which people can go and find freedom. I don't believe that any people are truly uh, free in this life. Uh, they are hostage, perhaps, to themselves, if not to others. And so, therefore, the discipline that is required to stay within an organisation is in itself good for people. But also, uh, the discipline uh, of the organisation itself, in policing itself, in making sure that as much freedom as possible is uh, retained by the people within that discipline, I think that's also very important. Churches like this uh, would not exist without an organisation because people simply wouldn't pull together. We're not at the stage in evolution where everyone can go their own way. One day we will be at that stage of evolution where everybody will accept the responsibility and they will come together only when it's needed. Unfortunately, that time is not yet. Perhaps it will come in my lifetime, I don't think so. I don't think it will come in my children or my children's children's lifetime. But nevertheless, I believe that in working for the freedom of your spirit, in working for the development and the progress of your spirit, then we are also working towards that day when organisation will not be necessary. It's a little bit like saying that uh, the rules of society are not necessary. Uh, they're limiting but they're limited for the whole, uh, as well as the few, and they are for the good of the whole. In having organisation, in having rules and regulations within that organisation, everybody is freer than they would otherwise be. Uh, they have rights that uh, perhaps um, otherwise would not be respected. Uh, they have an understanding and a security that would otherwise not exist. And so therefore, to me, uh, in accepting uh, those disciplines and accepting those benefits, I am willing to give up some of my freedom and some of uh, my desire for freedom uh, to adhere to that organisation. I said to you earlier that my work is within the organisation, and sometimes I wish it hadn't been. But there again, I recognise the fact that what I can give into the organisation is peculiar to me and it is also part of my development and part of my progress. And if we can look at things in that way, if we can recognise about the fact that what we do in this life is part of our progress, and the sun will shine no matter what you behave like. You will go on living no matter what you are, what you believe or what you behave like. However, it's far more pleasant if the sun is shining and it's far more pleasant if you go into the next world in a state of bubble of grace, uh, a state of knowing that you've done the best that you can and that you haven't done badly by other people. It's much better if you can go into uh, your next 
uh, part of your life. I'm not going to say next life because that would indicate that you have finished one life and start another. You don't any more than you finish your childhood and start your adult adulthood. You continue on from a baby into a little child, into a bigger child, into a teenager, into maturity, and then into, if you're lucky, old age, and then into your new age. And that comes after you die, after you leave this earth. And it can be as exciting as growing up. It can be exciting and rewarding as growing up. Because if you do your work properly when you are a teenager, a child and a teenager, then you mature into a reasonable, balanced person that is able to um, make their way in life and find the benefits in life and accept and use the benefits of life in a way that somebody that has not done that work would not be able to. In just the same way, if you use the knowledge that Spirit has given to you, and you use that uh, little voice of conscience that everybody has, uh, to, in the best possible uh, degree, then you will move on into the next stage of your life with a certain benefit, a certain um, you know, uh, gain that you would not otherwise have. So you see, you're going to go on living, but how you go on living immediately is up to you. It behoves you to behave yourselves. <laughs> it behoves you to think about what you are and what you can be and what you want to be. It behoves you to be as spiritual as possible in this life so that you can uh, walk on and walk proudly into the next part of your life, knowing that uh, you can stand tall and be counted. So you see, your loyalties are to yourself. Now that sounds funny coming from a person that is uh, so loyal to the union. But your world is not to yourself. You are responsible only for yourself. You are responsible for your development, your progress in your life. Nobody else can do it for you. Nobody else can live for you. Nobody else can die for you. You can't live or die for anybody else. You do it for yourself. The greatest sacrifice you make, you make it back for yourself. If somebody else benefits, that's wonderful. But it's your progress that is being made through that sacrifice. The greatest amount you can give, you are in fact giving to yourself. You may well benefit another person through that giving, but nevertheless the progress that is made through that giving is your own progress and your own benefit. And so you see, spiritualism is a very selfish religion in many ways as we are very selfish people. Uh, but it behoves us to remember that one day, one day, we will be one. One day, we will be one in God. And so all the benefits that you receive in this lifetime, whether they are from me or from another person, I will enjoy. And all the benefits that I receive in this lifetime, whether they be from you or from another person, you will enjoy. And so, enjoy life. Go through it. And enjoy spiritualism. It has so much to give. It gives you courage. It gives you understanding. It gives you horizons that can be so widened. Ladies and gentlemen, I commend this religion, this philosophy, this way of life, this spiritualism.
Um, I certainly uh, have never been to Japan or Australia or many of the places that I see on television. Um, many of the animals that I see are, I've never seen in the flesh. Mm. So I think that as with anything, you can use it to benefit yes. or you can use it to um, you know, complete it. Sure. Not to waste. Time. Yes, I can appreciate uh, what mm. you mean. Mm. Yes, I was just really mean. Yeah, that I understand piece. what you're saying. A lot of people I know, uh, uh, I mean, you read about it in the papers, couch pota potatoes and things like that, mm. uh, where children, instead of getting out and doing, uh, are in fact um, playing with their computers or watching television. Mm. But again, it's got to be personal responsibility. Yes, of course. Everybody's got choices. Yes. You can use anything. Uh, I mean, uh, electricity is good. Too much electricity is bad. It depends entirely the way you use it. I should tell my husband. <laughs> <laughs> questions I wrote down, I think you, you've answered them. Oh good. Uh, about, you know, what does spiritualism mean to you? I think you... Um, I didn't entirely ask, but spiritualism has actually given me confidence. Um, a lot of confidence. Because when I was uh, a teenager, I had no confidence whatsoever. Uh, and I have to say to you that uh, I did uh, mention my experience um, with the Baptists yes. and that, that eroded a lot of my confidence, I have to tell you, uh, because it made me feel so wicked. You know, the religion itself made me feel so wicked and so unworthy. What well, made you think about what you were doing, some things you were doing were wicked? Mm? I think uh, that, you know, it, it um, I thought that, you know, as a teenager, obviously, you do tend to do things that maybe you ought not to. Um, but it was more than that. It was just that I think the emphasis on being perfect was so strong within it. And I'm, I'm pretty intelligent, you know. Uh, and, and, and nobody's perfect. Exactly. Right? <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. You know, it, eroded my, it eroded what confidence I had. Um, so spiritualism has in fact, I can say that, that would be entirely untrue. Through spiritualism I have found my confidence. That might be a better way of putting it. Um, because I have been able to adopt it as my own. Uh, I have uh, found facets of my own character uh, that have expanded through spiritualism, um, which have in turn helped other people and in helping other people, I think you find your own confidence. Yes. So you help yourself. So, you know, spiritualism really, I think, has given me a way of life that I have personally found beneficial to me. And uh, certainly, um, it's helped me travel all over the world. <laughs> but, I mean, that is, that is the work I do in spiritualism. I think it, uh, we're going to stick to the, the real question of spiritualism, basically has uh, given me confidence. It's also, um, and it should do with everybody, given a different perspective on life. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, um, if, you, if you're going to imagine that you live in sort of 70 or 80 years and that's it, or you lie down to the trunk halls, you know, uh, that's giving you one perspective on life, a very, very narrow perspective. Whereas if you consider um, the spiritualist philosophy that you live on after death, you continue to learn. Yes, you see, that gives you a dimension. What I haven't learned here, I can learn then. Uh, what I've missed here, I can have then. You know, so, you know, is this is what you're saying then, that you, you take it on to your, to your next existence then, your next, mm -hmm. not, not your next life, your next... Yeah. Yes, it's my like continued you know. existence, yes. yes. No, my next, my next phase of life, my really. Phase of life. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I reach maturity, yeah. Only just really uh, approaching that now. <laughs> I was thinking the other day when uh, somebody was saying that middle age, 45, and I thought, I didn't even admit to middle age when I was 55. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm getting there now. <laughs> An old middle age. <laughs> Nevertheless, middle age. So you see, uh, it, it's given me a, a completely different perspective uh, on life. And, uh, I have to say, it's also given me a lot of friends. 
you know, a lot of friends. It is, um, it, it is like you know, a big family. Yeah. You know, if you approach it in the right way. How does it differ from other religions? It differs. Uh, well, I, again, I was quite a lot of friends. Yes, that's right. Um, I think the main um, way that it differs from other religions for me is uh, that it makes me very aware that the box stops here, uh, that I am responsible. Uh, sometimes uh, I have to say to you that uh, having accepted the fact that I am a minister of this religion, I genuinely wonder if we ought to have um, ministers. Uh, mainly because ministers infer that somebody else will speak to God for you. And that simply isn't part of the spiritualist philosophy. You speak to your own God in your own way. Um, the only thing I, I can say is that some people still do need to know that there is somebody that has a link with God. Yes. Um, so until they come to the realisation and the acceptance that they are part of God, they are an integral part of God, uh, then perhaps they do need somebody that they can trust to speak to God for them. Uh, so perhaps ministry is still necessary for a little while yet. Uh, hopefully one day it will not be. But um, when that day comes, hopefully uh, spiritualism will have enough um, cognizance uh, to be able to recognise that fact and do away with the ministry. Uh, please God. Um, what is it? it um, what, what is it like to experience something that is there but cannot be seen? Well, thinking about it, uh, sweetheart, um, go outside and look for the sun. You won't be able to see it. No. Okay? But it's there. You know it's there. You can feel it. You can feel the effect it has on you. Um, the scientists. Uh, acknowledge and identify um, a, a molecule called a neutrino and they can't, they can't see it. Uh, they can only identify it by the effect it has on other things. Uh, they can't trap it, they can't weigh it, they can't measure it. But they know it exists by its effect on other things. And so um, to experience spirit, um, not being able to see or hear, you know the effect they have on you. You know that, uh, in fact, I, I do see them from time to time, and uh, in my head I hear them. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I have learned to look and to listen and to uh, sense. And I have enhanced the, um, the faculties that I already had, um, so that I can do this successfully, and so that I can do it accurately, so that um, I, I'm able to identify accurately. And so that's what it's like. It's like knowing the sun is there and feeling the sun's rays and seeing the effect that the sun has on the earth. I don't need to see the sun. Okay, and again, you could use the wind as a similar um, thing. Uh, very often you, you can't see the wind, but you can feel it. Okay? Yes. Right. Does everyone have a soul? Yes. Yes. What, what, what are even animals? Um, they are part of a group soul. They are part of a group soul. If you think of soul um, as uh, being the individualization of spirit and the experiences on the earth, you know, you, you, everything that you experience on earth yes. um, goes into that individualization, uh, then uh, you, you're part of spirit, you see, and the soul is the individualization. Uh, of that spirit, the spirit being the whole. Can, can an animal ever, um, ever materialise as a human? Or will it just continue going on being an animal throughout all? I genuinely don't life? know. I genuinely so, don't know. Um, if, if I could answer that for you, I would. Uh, but I genuinely don't know. Uh, if you think of evolution, then you assume that uh, that uh, soul of the animal, or the spirit of the animal, um, continues in its form, in its present form. I don't, I, I'm not like the, the Hindus tend to think of um, the evolution as uh, going from one stage uh, into another stage, in other words, uh, like the, the chrysalis and the, the uh, moth. Uh, I tend to think that um, 
we don't have shape uh, and that sort of identity. Well, I mean, we do when we first go into the world of spirit, but once we actually make any progress in the world of spirit, in other words, once we move from the immediate um, entry into the world of spirit where we still have a human shape and uh, human um, memories and ideas, uh, humans are human shapes here on earth. Mm. And they, uh, we, we have this shape so that we can do things, so that we can travel through the physical world and uh, have effect in the physical world. Uh, but I don't believe that we are identified in the same way when we move on into the world of spirit. So therefore, you could say that the, a dog is a dog, uh, and a dog will remain a dog, but I don't think that it's as simple as that. Um, the dog has spirit, it's part of God, part of the great um, experience of life. And so it will go into the great experience of life. Now it won't sort of stay a dog shape, no, for eternity, but will rather be part of that great spirit. I told you, uh, we ultimately we're all one spirit, we're all yes. one, we belong. And so therefore that life will be part of uh, the whole, as we are part of the whole. And I don't think that you can uh, evaluate, mm. you know, um, the spirit of a human as being greater than the spirit of a, an animal. Um, because after all, when push comes to shove, we're only uh, elevated animals. Mm. <laughs> right. Um, do we all have the ability to experience it, um, <clears throat> which is a, a, what is it? I assume you mean psychic experience. Yes, yes. yes. But yes. you did say that we all do. Well, you do. Everybody does. Everybody does, to a greater or lesser degree, experience the psychic. Because we are psychic. It's a natural ability, it's a natural part of our faculties. Um, there are some people that um, cannot see as well as other people. There are some people that cannot um, feel music as well as other people. But we all have this, a degree of sight, providing you know we have uh, damaged our eyes in some way, uh, and we all have a degree of rhythm. Uh, it may not be very good, but it's nevertheless <laughs> there. And so yes, everybody uh, has the ability to experience. This is what I was saying to you uh, that the future is in the people. You know, the future of uh, mediumship is in the people. Not necessarily to uh, hear spirit or see spirit, mm -hmm. but certainly to feel spirit and to understand uh, that they are part of spirit. And so, you know, that is, to me, that is the future. Mm -hmm. I don't know when it will come about, but it is the future. Yeah. Well, I, think it, I think it will change, though. It's on the cuff, really. Oh, oh absolutely. It's, it's, it's not Do souls or alive people have colours around yeah. them? Yes. yes. Um, I was wondering that. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, some people can physically see the aura. It's called the aura. Yes. Um, and some people can physically see the aura. Other people, like myself, uh, can sense the aura and know what colours are around a person, know what those colours mean, um, and in fact, very often move back and forth into a person's life. It's quite funny, really, because I have experienced it twice myself. Mm. I have seen, uh, I did actually see a colour and a judge once. Oh, so even judges, are, even judges are human. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, and in fact, uh, if you if you look into um, as part of your studies, if you look into uh, the uh, Curlian photography, um, you will in fact see the colours uh, around uh, inanimate objects as well as uh, animate objects. So if you do look into uh, curling photography there, uh, you will actually see the aura uh, of things and people being put onto camera. So do, 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 does, does everybody have different colours? There are only really seven colors. main colours. Pardon? There are only seven main colours. So, you know, you've got a mixture of those seven colours. Yes. And uh, what happens is basically that everything that you experience or feel um, promotes a certain mental reaction. That mental reaction creates vibrations in the, uh, the brain. Uh, the brain gives off those vibrations, uh, which are then um, converted by a person that can see into colour around you. 
So basically it's, it's just reaction.